then we're going to wait just a few more minutes until we begin. So feel free if you want to put your name, your affiliation in the chat, any good news you may want to share about your organization, any upcoming. I the only one who can't get into the chat. It doesn't come on when I. The chat doesn't work on. It could be my computer. Yeah. I don't know why. <sighs> Krishna, we're recording this. Perfect. Right. And uh, I think yes. a lot of people's AI pilots are asking to record it as well. <laughs> I'm getting these notifications. And Anne, I wouldn't worry about the chat. It's not going to be a main focus of this oh, event. I, right, Krishna? So don't worry about it. And yeah, I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter where I'm from. So that's okay. mm -hmm. Well, you've introduced. Yeah, so we're all good. Oh, and here's Linda. Okay, great. I'm going to wait just another two minutes and we'll get going then. I just wanted to say you had a wonderful table at the summit the other last week. Thank the you. Library, yeah, the Westchester Library System, it was a wonderful table. That and the great. panel was terrific, Jan, on... Uh, oh, Data. Yes, uh, thank you. That was a good panel. Thank you. We're talking about the um, United Way... Um, right, I couldn't... ...leadership summit, everyone, in case you were wondering. And I promise I did not pay Anne to come mm -hmm. in here and <laughs> shower <laughs> us with compliments. Yes, I really appreciate them. Yes, <laughs> oh, I could give you some critiques, too. <laughs> As a yes, person you, who yes, you can, Ian. I know you. You can. You're, 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 I can do both. <laughs> My concern was it was an inaccessible building. Ooh. I I know that we um definitely heard that as part of the committee, and steps will be taken for next year. So thank you for that um, input on that. So I am going to begin. Thank you everyone who is here today. I am Jan Fisher, the Executive Director of Nonprofit Westchester. This program is part of our Nonprofit Asset Series where Nonprofit Westchester is really delighted to share all the riches of the nonprofit sector and what we have to offer the general community whether you're a nonprofit, a for-profit, or somebody from the business sector, higher education, nonprofit organizations have critical resources for our community. We started out with a program on mental health resources. Then we went to resources for uh, people that wanted to be supportive of the LGBTQ community and learn more about that in Westchester. And today, I'm particularly delighted to welcome our partners at the Westchester Library System. Uh, we couldn't do at NPW what we do without them. They provide us amazing space for training, a wealth of expertise, and they truly are such a partner to nonprofit Westchester. So a big shout out to them for everything they do for the community really, really excited to welcome them here. I have even learned so much in the process of helping to coordinate this initiative. There were so many fun and important things that the Westchester Library System does. And there are really some very serious and important contributions that they make to, to our community, um, both the library system and libraries. So we're thrilled to Welcome here today, Krishna Brodigan and Linda Smith from the library. And I do see that we have other team members from WLS on this, including the executive director, Terry Kirshner, 
and who I solicit all the time for advice and as a thought partner. So thank you, Terry. Thank you, Pat, who I see is on here too, Brigham. I think Dana is here too, and whoever else that I'm not seeing on my screen, we really feel you're part of the NPW team and we're delighted to share the wealth of your riches with the rest of the community. So with that, um, Krishna and Linda, it's all yours. Thank you, Jan. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, first of all, just gotta thank uh, Nonprofit Westchester for inviting us to do this presentation. Um, like Jan said, it's a wonderful, wonderful group. Uh, it has given us so many opportunities for networking and collaboration um, and really honestly just staying uh, in touch and uh, attuned with what all of these other great nonprofits are doing around the county. And as you'll see in the presentation today, that's paramount to the work that we're doing. Um, also just wanna pass along a thank you to everybody for coming here and taking the time out of your day to join us for this presentation. Uh, we've got people here from uh, other nonprofits. We have people who are just here as members of the public. We've got people from uh, WLS, so no pressure on me uh, <laughs> trying to convey the work that we're doing. Uh, and then we also have people joining from some of our member libraries and trustees. Uh, so really a big mix of people. Um, and I just wanna thank everybody for taking time out of their day to, to join us. Um, let me get my presentation slides up on the screen and we can get going. Um, yeah, so I will start with just a brief introduction of myself. My name is Krishna Brodigan. I am the uh, Director of Outreach at Westchester Library System. And I have been working here uh, since 2019. I came in uh, actually without a background in libraries. I, my background was in public health, but I found I kind of backed my way into libraries through this outreach position. Uh, and when I first came on, I was more so engaged with a lot of senior activities, which uh, we you know, are still directly engaged with today. But at this point, I am uh, working with all of our target, target populations that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, in the presentation. And with me today, I have Linda Smith uh, joining me, who is the Outreach Services Manager, um, my, my position that I filled prior to becoming the director. Um, and Linda, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, as you said, I'm Linda Smith. Um, I do have a bit of a background in libraries. I came from being the administrator of the Purchase Free Library, and then I started at WLS in 2021. Um, with um, working with the Project Hope program, which was an emotional support uh, response from um, to the pandemic from FEMA that worked with um, the Department of Mental Health and WLS. And then from there, um, I got put on full time and then I slowly weaseled my way into Krisha's position <laughs> and um, been there ever since. Thank you. I will throw the ball um, back to you. Yeah, so uh, today's presentation Libraries, nonprofit assets for every community. Um, we will be talking a little bit about WLS's role in the community, how WLS outreach operates. We'll talk about some specific examples. Um, and there will be plenty of time for Q&A uh, throughout the presentation. So what we'll ask you to do is uh, we'll take little breaks at certain points throughout the presentation. If you have questions at any point uh, that relate to the content that we're covering, feel free to throw them in chat. Linda will keep an eye on that. She can answer questions um, you know, as they come up. If there's something that's worth addressing uh, as a, a whole, we'll just bring those questions up during those little breaks. And then we'll have time at the end for uh, overarching Q&A. So we might save a few things for the end too, depending on how we're doing timing wise. Uh, so let's just get started by talking about what this presentation is going to be. Uh, so this presentation is not going to be a laundry list of everything that the libraries are doing, that they're engaged in, all of the projects that we have. Uh, if I were to do a presentation like that, it would we'd be here for easily five hours more. Uh, I could talk about libraries all day. So in the interest of time and your attention, uh, we're going to try to keep it more broad. Uh, so the objectives of, of what I'm really trying to accomplish today with this presentation is helping people uh, in the audience understand the modern role of public libraries, maybe to disabuse some um, you know, preconceptions or some maybe outdated uh, ideas of what libraries are up to in our communities, um, to talk about 
the work that WLS is doing in Westchester specifically to ground that mission of libraries in our local community, and then hopefully to inspire you to um, to learn more about library resources. So as I said at the beginning, we have people coming into this presentation, uh, in, into this audience from all different walks of life, different backgrounds and different interest levels. So whether that's just looking into some, some resources that the libraries provide for your own benefit, that's wonderful. Looking into those resources for people that you might serve, even better. Looking into the libraries for ways that you might be able to take advantage of our, uh, you know, being a cornerstone of the community, maybe for partnership, for promotion, all of that, even better. So I hope that uh, through today's presentation, you'll get to think about libraries kind of strategically in the way that I do, and you'll start to see them as this uh, amazing, flexible resource that really has, has drawn me into this field um, and stolen me away from public health. <laughs> so uh, let's get started with a Mentimeter activity. So this is uh, a, a system, uh, a app that we use, I guess, for uh, doing polls and word clouds. I'm just going to swap over to a different page here. Let's see. There we go. So now you should see uh, on your screen a Mentimeter slide with a question. What comes to mind when you think of a public library? And what you can do is you can either go to menti.com on your phone or tablet or whatever device you have, uh, or you can click right through to the link that I've put into the chat. And you have the opportunity to put in some phrases. You can put up to three things in. I think you can submit more than once if you really, if you're feeling passionate about it, but just give, give some examples of what comes to mind when you think of a public library. And... All right, perfect. We know it's working. That's always good, good first step. Got some good responses. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we're Too just gonna let it run for another. I know what I like about this is it, it also shows the uh, the volume of responses to a degree. So we can see books is, is high up there. All right, so I'm gonna let this stay open. Uh, people can feel free to, to continue throwing in responses um, as we start to kind of digest these. Uh, so I ask this question a lot uh, when I'm doing presentations. Um, you know, it's in my interest to, to have an idea of how people in the community abroad are viewing the libraries, what they think about when they think of us. Uh, and as you can see here, central to the library is the book, uh, which, you know, is a part of our identity that I don't think we'll ever uh, divorce ourselves from and not something that we wanna leave behind anytime soon. Uh, if anything, libraries are in the interest of, of maintaining our book collections while expanding collections elsewhere to improve access. Uh, but what I like to see in these responses are a lot of these uh, responses about community, free, resources, programs, storytelling, museum passes. Uh, you know, this is a this is a with it group. I, I figured that people attending a, a presentation like this would already kind of be attuned or interested in what's going on in their community. But you'd be surprised at how many people don't necessarily know all of these things that are available through their local library, especially if it's somebody who hasn't been to a public library in years, decades, perhaps. Um, and especially if it's somebody who is newer to our country and perhaps is not familiar with uh, the public library model from their home country. Um, there can be a lot of uncertainty or distrust or confusion about, you know, whether or not these services are actually free, what you can take advantage of. Um, and likewise, even people who are lifelong kind of fans of the library who have used the libraries uh, intermittently, they might not necessarily be uh, into, attuned to everything that the libraries are doing uh, at any given time. There's so much that we immerse ourselves in. The libraries as an institution are meant to kind of evolve and change with time. So there will always be, you know, new things available uh, whenever, whenever you're looking, um, especially if you haven't looked in a while. So I had mentioned earlier my background uh, in public health. And, you know, that might seem like a, a, a weird kind of connection. But when you're talking about library outreach work, uh, it requires a, a kind of perspective of the libraries. Um, 
that folds in a lot of these additional kind of concepts that people are mentioning here, community space, resources, free and open to all. Uh, so what we live in currently, uh, our society in, in America, um, you know, this was really exasper exacerbated during the pandemic, but, uh, you know, as it stands, people are working, they're trying to afford their lives, they're, uh, you know, most of our external spaces are tied to resources one way or another. Um, there aren't many spaces in our communities that are available to just anybody, regardless of status, regardless of, of income, uh, regardless of ability to pay for a membership. Uh, that's something that's really unique to the libraries. And what I what really drew me to this work was understanding that the libraries have potential. And their and their main goal really is to represent and serve the information needs of their community. One of the best ways we can do that is providing access to materials to allow people to uh, educate themselves, to gain glimpses into other perspectives, enrich their worldviews, and engage in programs that that uh, allow them to learn new things. But on a very fundamental level, the libraries represent a space where somebody can walk in, and if they do not have access to the internet, they can get access to that internet. They can have access to professionals who are there who can help them find information, understand it, and utilize it to their benefit. Um, so that that looks different depending on which community community you're going to. Communities have different needs. They have different challenges. Uh, and here in Westchester in particular, we have communities of all different sizes, uh, ranging from large cities to really, really tiny villages and who knows what other, uh, you know, mumbo jumbo they use to describe all the little hamlets and incorporated, unincorporated stuff in Westchester County. Um, let me hop back over to my slides here. So uh, when we talk about the library as an institution of a community, uh, it's really a unique resource. It's something that we don't see uh, you know, almost anywhere else. Uh, so in my mind, the kind of public health angle to that, a, a library is an engine. It's a resource that we can take advantage of to improve the lives and the means of the communities that they, uh, they exist in, uh, in a way where they can work as kind of you know, unifiers of um, of other groups and resources in the community. And that kind of ties into WLS's role in Westchester specifically. So uh, there are, I believe, 23 public library systems in New York State. Westchester Library System is just one of those. Um, we have some situations where we are very similar to other library systems and other situations where we're quite different. One of those, uh, one kind of key thing to understand in how uh, our system operates in particular is that we are a cooperative library system. So very often people will think uh, library system, all right, great. All one organization working in lockstep. That is actually not the, uh, the case for the majority of public library systems in New York. In our case, uh, we are a cooperative system where all of our member libraries, all 38 of them are you know, kind of doing their own thing. They've got their own policies, their own boards, they're running their own operations, their own programs, and they're doing a great job of it. Um, we exist more so as a kind of uh, partner agency that facilitates and bridges collaboration across all the libraries. We provide logistical support. So when it comes to things like, um, you know, delivering library materials between libraries, uh, we are the ones coordinating the delivery service. We do some backend uh, technical support as well um, with some of the software that the libraries use and also some of the tech that they have on site. Uh, and then also county-based outreach. Uh, pretty much every single one of our libraries does some community outreach uh, with their local community and sometimes with neighboring communities. Um, we are able to kind of take the broader view of outreach as a county-wide effort. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing is combining the resources and the manpower of the libraries, helping them take full advantage of that, um, you know, providing collective buying power, and then supporting where we can with training, with uh, development of specific um, programs and services, and 
facilitating partnerships where possible. Uh, the best place to learn more about WLS as a whole is to go to our website, which is westchesterlibraries.org. Uh, and there you can find information about uh, WLS, our activities, the services and programs that we provide. You can find uh, a list of all of the resources that you can find online with your library card. Uh, you can get direct access to the catalog and all of the print and digital uh, materials that we have. And you can also find your local library and other libraries near you uh, with our library locator tool. Um, let's see. So something I have to bring up uh, early in the presentation, and we will revisit this, uh, is the library card. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming that most people in the audience have a library card or have had one at one point in their life. Uh, this is a really uh, significant document. For many people, it's their first form of identification, which is kind of a badge of pride for the libraries um, and our overarching goal of, of spreading, um, you know, the awareness and, and uh, importance of democracy in our communities. Uh, getting access to that library card, that free library card, opens up a lot of doors. And I would say that a big portion of the outreach work that we're trying to that we do uh, is really steering people towards getting these these permanent cards. So let me give you some examples of what a library card is, what it isn't, and how we kind of work around um, what we have in the community in the county. So each library, uh, each member library, is uh, responsible for setting up library cards for their local community. You're eligible for a free library card in Westchester County if you live here, uh, if you work in the county, if you go to school in Westchester County, or if you own property. Basically, anything that feeds into the local tax base uh, qualifies you for a permanent library card at that home library. This is where the westchesterlibraries.org website comes into, into play. If you need to figure out what your local library is, you can go on there, put in your zip code, and find the nearest library. Uh, or you can just give them a call and say, I live at this address. Does this count? Uh, you know, are you my local library? And if that's not the case, they'll point you in the right direction um, to get the card. Again, each of our libraries has a different, a slightly different process for getting that permanent card. Some libraries allow you to start the process online. Others prefer you to go in in person. The best thing you can do is go and check your library's website or give them a call. Typically, you're going to need to provide some proof of ID and proof of address just to show that you are who you are and that you live in the community or work there or go to school there. Uh, and at that point, you will receive your permanent library card. Permanent in the sense that they expire every three years, but it's very easy to renew. Um, if anybody here hasn't renewed their card or they're just not really sure about the current status of their library card, just give your library a call. They'll see if there's a record still in our, uh, our catalog system. And if not, they'll help you get a new one set up. If there is one, they can renew it for you. Um, now, the cards are important if you want to borrow materials or if you want to access some of the online resources that the libraries provide. Uh, in terms of coming into the library and using services, uh, the majority of programs uh, and services won't necessarily require you to have your own card. There are some, uh, some uh, exceptions to that rule, but in general, uh, there's nothing stopping somebody from just walking into a library and using the library. In fact, we would love uh, more people to do that even if they aren't you know, necessarily sure that they qualify for a card. There are some folks in Westchester County who maybe uh, don't have access to ID or don't have a permanent address. We see this very often when we're working with folks uh, who might be in a shelter or um, between housing. Um, in that case, what we do at WLS is we will provide access to a temporary library card uh, for six months that just gives you access solely to the online resources, just as a bit of a bridge to give people that initial access. Um, but in general, if you have any barriers to getting a library card, talk to your library, talk to us. We'll try to work around uh, what we can and, and figure out you know, how, we can, how we can progress and, and get you access to these resources. Because our goal is really for everybody to be able to use these things, to be aware of what the libraries are offering. So with that in mind, I'm just going to take a break and just see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to throw anything else out if you have questions so far. I have a question. Yeah, Jan. So, you, so for um, organizations that are serving 
newly arrived neighbors, immigrants to this county, it seems that what you were just saying about the library cards and access to libraries has some great implications for their access to information and community. And can you expand more on that if that is in fact the case? And, and what about bilingual bicultural services as well? Yes, um, so I was going to talk later in the presentation, I'll, I'll come back to right. some of the newer e-resources that we pulled together and some of the work that we're trying to do to reach uh, those Spanish speaking populations and uh, you know newer families, immigrant families. Uh, it is a challenge for us, um, both in terms of reach and also making sure that we're providing uh, good information and digestible information to these audiences. Um, so on the bare level or on the surface level, we will provide uh, you know, information referrals to libraries that are offering ESL classes, um, you know, libraries that are offering com conversation courses, cultural programs. Um, we'll try to connect people with other groups in the community that are providing those classes and services directly themselves. Um, and then on our end, we've been trying to pull in uh, some new resources that are more catered specifically to uh, immigrant populations, specifically to Spanish speaking populations, to fold in some of that kind of cultural um, cultural sensitivity and uh, understanding into it. Um, now, one thing that we are starting to look into a little bit more is uh, providing support for business owners, or small people trying to start small businesses or establish um, you know their own kind of self-run, uh, business or service in Westchester County. We recognize that that's a pretty, um, I'm hoping it, okay. a pretty it's straightforward way for people to it. get, uh, no, I don't have sensitive ears. Uh, please mute yourself. Said. Please mute yourself. Space partnerships, like just, no, it's okay. libraries just are an underused that. resource. Yeah, and so, uh, okay. I don't want to be sure. We need Girls Inc. Can we mute girls? Like, thank Sorry you. about that. I, I found them. Okay. No worries. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, not to get too far ahead of myself, but uh, reaching Spanish speaking populations and immigrant families in particular is difficult. We're trying to look, um, you know, at the, the goals that they have in mind. Uh, very often that is related to education. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the high school equivalency and GED support that we provide. Uh, and then in other cases, it's more economic. It's people trying to, um, you know, reach a level of stability with their employment. And in many cases, that's trying to make, uh, you know, their own business that they can kind of um, have a lot of control over. And so we are, you know, I say we, it's WLS and member libraries uh, that are trying, that are seeing this need in their community. We're working on expanding those services uh, currently, but it's it remains a, a big challenge for us. I have one question in the chat, which says, why do you cards expire after three years seems kind of a short time frame. Can that policy be changed? You know, that's a good question. I believe that it has to do with records retention um, and just, you know, reducing clutter. Libraries are, are as a whole, uh, committed to privacy. So in general, we try, uh, you know, not to, to keep identifying records uh, longer than we need to. And so, you know, they expire after three years. The record in the system doesn't get deleted for a while beyond that. But I think the idea is just to reduce clutter uh, so we can kind of see how many active users we have, how many people are are currently signed up for cards and all of that. Um, but then again, you know, I, I don't think that there's, uh, I don't know if there's any kind of like statewide edict that says that it needs to be three years. So, you know, it's, it's a question for your library too. Um, or perhaps it's a question for us, but I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, all right, so I went over kind of WLS as a whole. Um, I Something that I do wanna go back and just mention a little bit more this outreach element. Uh, so when I talk about outreach, it's worth mentioning uh, that for WLS as a whole, we have an outreach department that I'm about to talk about a little bit more, but outreach really is a central goal for the organization as a whole, regardless of who you're talking to, which department you're talking to. While we do a lot of this logistical support, we are also you know, forging ties with the, the member libraries. We're connecting them with organizations in the community that could be beneficial. And we're you know, looking at county initiatives, county activities 
that align with the goals of the libraries and trying to bring those opportunities back to them as well. Um, so, you know, engagement in groups like this, like Nonprofit Westchester, help us uh, kind of stay attuned with what's going on and look for those opportunistic um, ways to, to collaborate. Um, so we we really, we, we do outreach uh, in a broad scale, and then we do it kind of in a focused, uh, focused uh, approach. And that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in talking about the Westchester Library System Outreach Team and our projects. So who are we? Uh, right now on the call, you have me, uh, the director and Linda, Outreach Services Manager. We also have a uh, youth services consultant, Dana Heisel, um, who fills some other shoes at the library uh, related to construction uh, grants and legislative advocacy. Uh, another important role that, that we immerse ourselves in. Uh, and then we also have a number of uh, part-timers and other employees at the system who support us in our role. Um, too many to name, it's basically everybody. But our, our real goal is to um, you know, share the existing library services with people in need, as I've been saying, let them know that the libraries are here to support, to provide, uh, to provide services that they need that could benefit them. Uh, also to develop new library services, um, both delivered directly through WLS and through partnerships with member libraries uh, to better suit the needs of some of these uh, special populations that I'll, I'll talk about. And then um, to bridge libraries, community partners, and residents. So really it's, it's kind of a mix. It's information referrals and it's partnerships and it's direct information services. So New York State education law actually outlines the responsibilities of outreach positions at these public library systems. And uh, while the kind of overarching guidance of what we're supposed to be doing and the populations we're supposed to be serving is consistent across all of the public library systems, the way that we do that work changes uh, based on the nature of the system and the area that we're serving. So New York State education law says we are particularly supposed to be looking at the uh, populations who uh, you know have people who are blind or have physical disabilities, seniors, people with developmental or learning disabilities, uh, people living in institutionalized settings, which includes the jail and the correctional facilities in the county, members of ethnic or minority groups, um, you know, people with educational disadvantages, people who are unemployed or underemployed, geographically isolated, at-risk youth. It's so wide-ranging that just about you know everybody in the county fits into one or more of these categories, but uh, it can also be overwhelming in terms of trying to serve all these organizations. So what we typically try to do down here in Westchester is uh, because we have this amazing network of nonprofits that we don't necessarily see um, in the same concentration elsewhere in the state, especially you know the further north and northwest you go, um, what we do is we will see kind of from the what the member libraries are reporting back to us, uh, pressing issues that they're seeing in their community. We'll look at initiatives that are being carried out by the county government, by other nonprofits, uh, and we'll look at, at the resources that are available, both in terms of uh, you know, things that can serve these groups and also uh, gaps, service gaps that we might be able to, to use the libraries to bridge or fill. Um, when we talk about the, the way that this outreach work manifests, uh, like I said, it really depends on the county and the system that you're in. For Westchester Library System, we serve just Westchester County, which is uh, such such a benefit to us. Um, and that's kind of typical for the uh, library systems in the Metro, uh, or I guess the, the Hudson Valley and uh, Southern New York uh, regions. But as you go further North, things get a little more spread out. They don't have the, uh, the same kind of uh, service, you know, density that we have down here. So we try to take advantage of of that environment as much as we can. And I've been kind of teasing at this, but the WS outreach approach really can be boiled down to a simple kind of three pronged uh, approach. We wanna provide information and service referrals. This kind of goes back to uh, a primary mission that the libraries have, have uh, you know, been leading for a long time, which is just, we are information professionals before the existence of online search engines. Uh, the library was the place where you could go for information, to ask your research questions, to find resources in your community. And that is still the case. Uh, you know, with the advent of Google and all of these search engines uh, and the ability to access these things from our pockets uh, with our smartphones, I think that there's a kind of um, 
there has been this general feeling of, okay, well, do we need a reference desk at the library? Do we still need to be able to go to the library and ask questions? Uh, why can I do that? Or why should I do that when I can just find that information on my phone? Well, uh, you know, it is no, I, I, it's not a secret that, uh, you know, as a nation, as a world, we have been dealing with more and more challenges around misinformation, disinformation. Uh, these problems are not going anywhere soon with social media, especially with, um, you know, AI becoming more and more prevalent, um, you know, scams, all of these things on the internet. Uh, it's hard to find quality information. Uh, and something that might have been easy to find on Google back in the day, now you might have to sift through some sponsored links. Um, it's still, the libraries still represent a institution where you can go ask for information and not only get resources and information, but also get a helping hand who can kind of listen to your situation, tailor the information to your needs and uh, kind of work you, with you through that. So this is really valuable still for people who aren't as internet savvy, maybe just don't have access to that tech or just don't really know what's out there. Um, that's kind of the, I guess, the other side of the two-sided two uh, sword uh, of having this rich service environment in Westchester County. While we have a lot of services that can help people, uh, it can sometimes be hard to find all of those resources and parse that information. So information and service referral, crucial to what we do. Direct service uh, is really our, our way of kind of filling in the gaps around that. So we will point people in the direction that they need to go to get the help they need. But sometimes, uh, you know, they have needs that are a little bit more particular uh, to what is currently available in the county. And we'll try to fill in uh, with direct service there. And so ways that that has really um, come up in the past would be through things like our uh, high school equivalency volunteer program, where we help people who are trying to get their GED, um, our reentry services, where we have provided tech training and accessible uh, or access to devices and internet hotspots that people can use, um, you know, to, to find information that they need online. Um, and really so many more of our projects. And then the third the third kind of prong of this work is uh, our partnerships. So, you know, maintaining these partnerships with other nonprofits in the county um, is really crucial for us in terms of just knowing where we can send people if they need help, knowing that they're getting the help that they need once they get there. Uh, and to flip it back around, we also uh, serve as a mouthpiece for a lot of these, these services and benefits that are available in the county. Uh, the libraries represent a way that partner agencies can reach people uh, that they might be able to serve, especially if this is some newer project that they're bringing in. Um, and very often we'll just try to do our best as a signal booster to let people know what's what's out there. So I'm going to take another break from talking and I'm going to drink some water uh, and I'll take a uh, look Chris at the. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We have, I was going to say, uh, I think you're about to say it, but we have a couple uh, questions that kind of fit into the uh, partner um, stuff we were talking about. Um, sure. If you wanted to take a look at those, we have um, from Sharon. She says, the WLS currently partner with any organizations to provide free access to social workers at member libraries? If not, is there a perspective to do so? Mm. So this is actually something that uh, is kind of a trend in libraries, especially urban libraries, the idea of having social workers on staff. Um, and you know, when that's not possible, having social workers come in from other organizations. While WLS doesn't have a formal relationship with any of the organizations that provide access to like social workers in the county, we do have, um, you know, we're very friendly with organizations like MHA and FSW and uh, FSSY and all these other groups. Um, too many to count, honestly, that provide uh, different types of counseling in the in the libraries. And those groups are crucial uh, to, uh, you know, bringing in uh, people who can come and set up a table or set up a, a specific program at a library to provide information about these services and also do that one-on-one -on -one counseling. So uh, it's worth reaching out to your local libraries, seeing, uh, you know, checking on their calendar to see if they have any of these things listed or just seeing if they, if they have that available. Um, very often, uh, the people coming into table at the libraries are coming for more specific um, kind of uh, uh, services. So perhaps it's more related to mental health. Perhaps it's more so about healthcare navigation. So we frequently have people coming into the libraries to talk about, uh, to pr provide assistance with navigating the healthcare marketplace, 
Medicare marketplace. We have um, AARP coming in every spring to do tax prep. Um, in terms of social workers, though, no official kind of partnership there. It's really something that we pull together um, uh, opportunistically. And, I, and I do have some feedback, like a little bit of yeah. input, um, insight on that also. When we did the Project Hope um, program, which was a form of, you know, a, a, a emotional support counseling during the pandemic, um, speaking with other libraries, um, some libraries at some point did have some type of thing going on, but the short answer to why some, why more libraries don't have it is a matter of staffing on uh, the unfortunately overworked social worker side. You know, it would, they, you know, some of them have very large caseloads and they, we want to get some, some of the libraries have tried to get them in the libraries, but it's just they've, their organizations have been understaffed, but it is something that individual libraries have been trying to work on and through our partnerships with like with like like Chris had said with um mental health organizations we're we're working on things like that but we do on an outreach level when we do have people who reach out about those type of services we do as much as possible try to put them in the right hands yeah we're opportunists that's this whole this whole presentation can be boiled down to we are opportunists and we when we try to make a you know, space where we can for all these things. Um, and I see another question in here that uh, is just about whether or not WLS has grown as a result of the internet, or if it's more um, uh, challenged like many businesses or, or changed. Um, yeah, so the internet uh, with the libraries, uh, it's an interesting thing. I, you know, talking about the whole kind of Google side of it is really just one part of it. Um, what we're seeing is, uh, with the the kind of expansion of access to the internet that we've seen over the past 20 years, um, the libraries served a couple of different roles there. One, they were critical in terms of giving access to uh, computers and uh, training to be able to use those computers and um, you know you know learn about the internet. Um, we're actually I I have a feeling that we're seeing the kind of a, an echo or a return of that in some ways with uh, artificial intelligence as well. Um, you know, libraries do a lot with uh, maker spaces and technology uh, these days. And AI is, is a big topic of conversation for us. I know many of our libraries have already started holding programs about AI uh, for their patrons. And I just, I get the sense that as, uh, you know, artificial intelligence moves out of that buzz phase and into the more functional, okay, this is, we're using this day to day, like we are using the internet now. Uh, I do see the libraries as as needing to fill that that kind of training role again, that community training role. Uh, so in a way, I would say that the internet has changed us or challenged us to change uh, more than it has hurt us. Uh, you know, it's it's caused us to kind of branch out into other formats. Um, you know, availability of collections over the internet has not resulted in uh, you know a loss of books or print material in the libraries. It's just given people another way to interact with library materials um, in a much more convenient fashion. So I, I say that the internet and AI, all of that, it really is just making us kind of look again at the services that we're providing and, and making sure that that we're you know fitting the current needs of our communities. And oh, I really and like quick, this quote oh, that sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I just love the quote that Kim threw in there too. The Google will bring you back a hundred thousand answers. A librarian will bring you back the right one. Exactly. <laughs> Linda, what and were you going to say? I was just going to say my, my point of view for, as um, someone in the library is a little dated because I've been out of the library director position for a couple of years, but I've seen firsthand how the libraries have, you know, just they've grown with the technology. A lot of people, when when Amazon was starting to sell books, people thought that library was going to close. When Barnes and Noble and all those things happened, you know, libraries have just always evolved. When people like when I worked at the library, people still called asking for origins of words. Um, so as long as we, as long as libraries have been able to adapt, you know, with, with as he mentioned the um, with the internet question, all the questions with the internet, you know, we've made the libraries have provided more scam programs, more information to protect yourself for internet, more um, just, be, you know, when the, with, the, with the AI, more programs about um, protecting yourself against AI. So it hasn't really, I don't think it's necessarily challenged. It's just forced libraries and librarians to just be quicker thinkers and more innovative. Also, I think it, 
it's allowed us to have a little more fun with uh, online programs and all sorts of other stuff. So at the end of the day, I think that's, I think these things all kind of make the library a more, a more kind of holistic uh, community space. All right. Uh, so I have another kind of breakout Mentimeter loaded up here. Uh, this time, the question is, what are some barriers for a working adult trying to get their GED? So now that I've been talking about the paradigm, this, this kind of three-pronged approach that we take to our outreach, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about how this actually shakes out in practice. So I believe we should be sharing the Mentimeter screen again, and I'll send into the chat once more this link to uh, the Mentimeter word cloud. But my question here is, what are some barriers that a working adult might experience trying when trying to get their GED, so trying to get their high school diploma? This is a very common goal for adults in Westchester County, especially if they are trying to you know, improve their career aspects, um, look for new opportunities. All right. Seen some good ones here. I want to say especially a special call out for shame. Uh, you know, whether there's a softer word for that, it's very true. It's it's something that, you know, people might feel nervous about. Um, something that people can feel nervous about talking about sometimes, especially if they've tried to start the process uh, and failed or, you know, fallen off their their kind of progress in the past. Um, so I'll let this keep ticking out, but let's just relate this back to the outreach model. So that model, we were talking about information services, direct assistance, partnership. So when it comes to the GED, we uh, at WLS have been engaged in that space for quite a while. Um, you know, it started, I believe, as more so giving information about getting uh, your GED. So there's actually quite a few pathways to doing that. Uh, you know, aside from just taking the GED exam, there are ways to apply regents exams to get out of subject tests. Uh, you can you can convert a foreign diploma. There's also a study program where you can start earning uh, college credits while completing your, your GED. Um, so there's quite a few options. And while the GED exam is the, the primary, you know, method that, that people will take, uh, it's worth knowing about all those things. So we provide information uh, to anybody in Westchester County who is trying to get their GED about the process. Uh, we have information on our website, firstfind.org. We also have booklets and handouts that we provide that talk about the process of getting the your GED uh, or your high school equivalency diploma, um, You know what to expect from the GED exam. And then we also send them uh, to, we give them information on where they can access GED classes, uh, GED practice resources, um, both online, in person, and through organizations in the county. That's the information referral side of it. But talking about barriers to getting a GED, what we're seeing here, uh, some of the barriers that you might find, time. I would say that's the biggest one, and it makes sense. It's the most submitted uh, answer here. Uh, a lot of the high school equivalency classes that are available in the county are fixed time, uh, certain times of the week, maybe um, you know certain evenings. Um, child care, money, all of these things factor into that time as well. It's kind of a, compa a compounding, uh, compounding challenge in that people who are trying to get their GED very often are working. Uh, they might be working multiple jobs. They've got families, they're raising kids, uh, they're trying to provide. So they are already uh, at just like the maximum in terms of scheduling and mental load. Um, what we provide now uh, through our GED Academy program, our high school equivalency uh, uh, coaching system, we will allow any resident of Westchester to reach out to us, uh, get in touch with um, trainers who can kind of help them walk through that process of uh, getting their high school equivalency diploma. And then we also give them access to a self-paced training program called GED Academy that allows them to build up their skills uh, and work towards that goal of passing the GED exam. Uh, we have volunteer coaches who work with these students one-on-one, um, -on -one, uh, mostly remotely, but the goal there just being another kind of helping hand who can kind of keep tabs of your progress, make sure that you're working towards your goals. And when you hit snags, when you're getting uh, stuck on certain parts, um, you know, you have a helping hand there, a trusted voice who can say, 
okay, let me help you with that. Um, it's a process. It's a long, long process. Confidence comes up in here, uh, kind of tied to the shame thing, uh, the time constraints, all of that. The reality of somebody getting their GED is they're going to be working towards this goal for years. Very often, a big part of that is building up fundamental skills uh, around literacy, just being able to read and parse the rest of the exam. It helps you on every single subject. Um, and also just maintaining that kind of confidence that, yes, I can do this. I'm making progress and I someday will have my GED uh, or I will pass the GED. Now, uh, we, by providing that kind of, um, you know, additional self-paced training with the coach input, uh, we're not necessarily trying to take people out of any of these other classes. In fact, we're still encouraging people to take advantage of those, but we're trying to reach people in a way that's a little bit more accessible to them. You can see that we're being opportunistic and trying to see where we can kind of insert the library to supplement the services that are available elsewhere in the community. Let me jump back to our presentation. Um, and I just want to toss it over to Linda now, who can kind of talk about how this uh, that kind of model fits into uh, our reentry work as well. Hello again. So um, yeah, as the slide says, uh, as the slide says, um, how do we remove barriers for people returning to Westchester after incarceration? Um, with the model that we have, um, what we do, you know, we, we work with a lot of people. Sorry, I'm getting very distracted by the uh, people outside of my house. <laughs> so the way that we um, that we help with this um, remove barriers is helping connecting that, helping them reconnect with the community, get back in touch, just find a simple connection with organizations. Um, we work with the DOC pre-release team a lot, and um, we see that the people who are being released immediately get put into shelters and have um, little to no connection to um, to Westchester County, uh, to the resources or even how to find them. So um, what we do with that is we make connections through our um, through our community partners. I help we help them with um, making connections through we we help them with finding technology as Krish had mentioned to connect to them with resources, but in a closed loop kind of resource way. We don't just give them an we just we don't just give them a number and say here you go find your way. We make we you know we through the programs like HSC, um, um, as you, what you noticed before with the previous slide is that these um, issues that they have, um, they it's not limited to um, the GED program. People with um, reentry issues, people in minority groups, people with um, um, all those outreach, um, um, what you go, sorry, um, groups we're trying to reach have the similar have similar issues and we help remove those just by you know help by connecting them and in this i'm, I'm sorry i got very okay. nervous um chris i'm gonna ask you to take the lead i totally lost my place no worries no worries uh, yeah it's just it's um with this population in particular uh the typical barriers that you might see for somebody who uh you know is struggling in the in the county just times 10 uh you know housing core issue for them. Uh, it makes it much harder to, to accomplish everything else that they're trying to do. Uh, everything else that we provide support for, whether it's job search assistance, uh, we have a job search coach, uh, getting that high school diploma, um, you know, finding housing, finding food, all those things. There's just extra barriers for people in reentry. Um, and, you know, the tech issue, the digital divide, a huge problem for this for this community. So again, this is a situation where there are groups in Westchester County that are doing great work uh, for people who are have a history with the justice system. Our goal is to connect them with those other organizations, to connect them with those resources, and give them uh, kind of like a a concierge, somebody who can be their their friend, their helping hand in getting reestablished in the community. It's um, beyond you know this the direct assistance that we're providing. We're also trying to to you know, be kind of liaisons for Westchester and say, listen, we understand that you have a history, but we understand that you want to be a, uh, you know, contributing member of this community. How can we help you do that? And more often than not, they're just looking for, uh, for opportunities there. So, um, you know, this extends, this model extends to the work that we do with seniors. Uh, we connect seniors with needed information. But when we find that, uh, you know, there is a bit of a lack of, um, of clarity around finding that information, for instance, uh, seniors with declining vision, 
we found that it was kind of difficult to understand what types of services are available and, and which organizations people could go to if they're starting to experience vision loss as a, as a senior. Um, that's a perfect situation where we can insert ourselves, say, listen, we'll help you find that information. We'll help you actually get in touch with these organizations that can help you. And at the same time, we can talk to you about using the library in a way uh, that you know, you'll still be able to take advantage of the resources that we have, the materials that we just, that we circulate, the programs that we run, uh, even if vision is a, a challenge for you. So it, it really extends so far to all of those um, target populations that, that Linda was talking about again. Um, and I, I have to bring a special like shout out to our online resources. Uh, this is really, really our outreach secret weapon. Um, we have a variety of e-resources that WLS um, purchases with uh, all of our member libraries with you know collective purchasing. These are all things that are available to anybody with a library card in the county. Um, and this ranges from you know just reading material. So we have apps like Libby and Hoopla where you can find books, audiobooks, movies, music, comic books, graphic novels, uh, Tumble Books, which is a collection of specifically um, picture books and uh, children's books that you can find digitally uh, so that, you know, if you need books for story time at night, there you go. Medici.tv, Canopy, uh, The Shelf, these are all streaming video platforms. So, you know, you basically have a, a version of Netflix with your library card. People are often shocked to find that out. Um, and then we also have learning resources too. There's databases that you can search. Um, there's also programs like GED Academy that I mentioned for getting that, uh, that practice towards uh, passing the GED. We have tutor.com, which is a great service for accessing um, tutors, live tutoring uh, and homework help. Uh, they also provide assistance for things like citizenship exams, like practicing for that. Um, it's really a wonderful resource. Uh, and then LinkedIn Learning, if you're, if you're on LinkedIn, you may have seen some of their advertisements for tutorials and programs. And Mango Languages, a language learning app. We use all of these, um, both as an example of what you can find with the library, the value of having that library card, but also to help people on those specific goals. So let's say somebody is trying to take the, um, the GED and their primary language is, is Spanish. We'll often encourage them to take that exam in Spanish, which is an option that they have, but at the same time, they can practice it in English if they would like to. They can also build their English skills with Mango Languages, they can immerse themselves in English language by reading or viewing materials on these other streaming services. We try to we try to show them how they can use these things strategically in a way that helps them with those goals, but also you know can be entertaining and engaging, um, maintaining that kind of uh, maintaining that uh, that spirit and that confidence is is huge in all of these different programs and services that we offer. So uh, I encourage you to check the Westchester Library's website or your local library's website, which should list a lot of these online resources. Typically, you'll just need a library card to access them. Um, but if you have any trouble accessing these things on your computer or a smartphone or a tablet, feel free to call your library and they can kind of help you out uh, with that. And I see that we're getting close on time. So I want to keep things moving and get to the questions that we have in the chat. Uh, another service or, or group that I need to, to point out from Westchester Library System is WLS Career Coaching Services. So as part of our outreach work, we provide uh, assistance for people who are trying to job search. But we also um, at WLS, we have a career coaching team that provides a lot of assistance for people who are um, trying to plan or manage a career. So, you know, Whereas somebody who's looking for you know, first job might benefit from talking to our job search coach, somebody who's making a transition in careers or trying to you know, step into a new career, or perhaps is looking at how to kind of pivot their career, maybe pre or post retirement. Um, this is, the, this is the, the group at WLS that, can, that could provide some really wonderful uh, workshops and, and services to you. I definitely encourage people to check out their website, wscareercoachingservices.org to find out more. Um, and we have links to our other websites that, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to go through the full list of all of our outreach projects, but you can see uh, some on these different websites that we have some examples of the activities that we engage in. Um, Firstfind.org is our website for kind of general adult and family resources. Uh, that includes the high school equivalency and job searching assistance. 
Um, Connections is our website for those reentry populations and justice impacted individuals. We have two websites really for seniors, uh, one being seniors.westchesterlibraries.org. That's about general senior services and information that we provide. And then seniorlawday.info is a website we manage for the Senior Law Day Collaborative um, here in Westchester, another wonderful partnership that we uh, participate in. Um, and then uh, we also have information about digital equity and uh, mental health and resilience in the community. So I encourage people to check out these links on their own time just to, uh, to, to learn a little bit more about what we're doing. Uh, and you know these will be available in the slides that we circulate. And um, again, thanks everybody for, for joining in on today's uh, program. I'm now gonna open it up to questions. I see some questions coming into the chat already, uh, but please, throw any questions you have in the chat. If you'd like to hear a little bit more about specific uh, resources, I'll do that if I have time, but otherwise I encourage people to reach out uh, for more details. The goal, I hope that people were able to kind of uh, get from this presentation what I was hoping to convey, which is that the libraries uh, are still relevant. They'll remain relevant as cornerstones of the community, a place where anybody is welcome, regardless of you know financial input, regardless of, uh, of status, in uh, a citizenship status, any of that. Our goal is to be there for the communities, to adapt our services, to fit those needs, and to be uh, a, a channel for community partnership uh, and reaching people in need. So I hope that was really helpful. Um, Krishna, can you stop sharing your screen at this point so we could all see each other? Absolutely. Yeah, and then... And let's take a look at this chat now see. Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody asked if volunteers are needed for uh, help with reentry. So right now, we only uh, have one main volunteer program, which is the high school equivalency program. But that in mind, um, you know, there are no shortage of library champions. And if people are interested in helping out uh, in some way, reach out to us um, and, and we'll see what we can do. If we can't use you, then perhaps we can we can connect you with an organization that could. Um, you Thank you for the, the kind college words. College counseling services. Yes. Uh, so on firstfind.org, when you go there, you'll also see our college counseling services, which in um, we have a college help desk uh, person who will help people with understanding financial aid, um, you know, navigating the college application process. Uh, and more importantly, um, I think one of the most important roles that she serves is helping people understand how to stay on the ball once you've been accepted to college. Um, you know, getting accepted is really just that first hurdle. But beyond that, there's all manner of um, paperwork that you need to submit, hoops that you have to jump through. Uh, and this can be a problem, especially for families that are sending their first generation uh, uh, American citizens to uh, college or, you know, sending their first generation to college in general. Um, this can be a really foreign process. Uh, so we have a bilingual counselor who um, helps people with that. And there are a number of other groups in the county uh, that provide that assistance, um, especially currently with the FAFSA having undergone some changes. Um, so I, there's a, there, there are some other groups like the Carver Center um, that are providing counseling there too. So we'll connect people with our college help desk, we'll connect people with other local groups that can provide that support. Um, yes, so I see somebody mentioning delivery to people at home. Uh, E-resources really only serve just one kind of portion of the, the homebound population, and that being the most digitally skilled. Um, that is not the case for everybody. We are putting together a program to provide library services to people uh, by mail. This is something that many of our libraries have already started doing, uh, either through library staff or volunteers or, um, you know, trustees, friends. Uh, just kind of doing these deliveries on their own. So we're trying to we're trying to make that a more uh, standardized um, service available to people. And uh, leasing laptops is an interesting one. So during the pandemic, especially on the tail end of that, the digital divide was the thing, as I'm sure you all remember. Uh, it's still a really relevant issue, um, but I think some of the buzz has kind of died out around that. What the libraries have done, uh, have been doing through that whole process is providing access to laptops and uh, hotspots and devices that people can then take with them or use on site uh, to get access to that stuff. So um, that is heavily library dependent and 
you know, in flux. So my number one uh, recommendation there is reach out to your library, see what they're lending. Um, but on that page, uh, on the website that I mentioned for digital equity uh, in the slides, there's a, a, a start, sort of outdated list of some of those uh, libraries that are doing lending. Put it in the chat. Oh, thank you. Beautiful. I have another question. Go ahead, Ann. I'm, I'm curious if there's any thought ever again to reviving the bookmobile services. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Um, we have played around with uh, having a, a, actually during the, the pandemic, we got a, a digital equity van and we played around with that. It's an interesting model. Um, I think that there's certain applications where a bookmobile is helpful. I think that we as an organization are leaning a bit more towards um, utilizing uh, like community partners for some of those activities as like kind of one-off events rather than uh, a mobile. But, you know, that's not to say that we won't necessarily revisit that somewhere down the road. Um, it's just that in a county like Westchester where things are really kind of tight together, uh, there, we don't necessarily see it offering too much um, added benefit over the tabling and site visits and things that we, we currently engage in. That's true. And you had mentioned uh, seeing us at an event. We do a lot of uh, tabling events, um, sometimes with member libraries as partners, uh, where we share this information out in the community. So a lot of that is um, you know us going to big senior events, like the Salute to Seniors, um, going to job and career fairs that are happening around the county. Um, so, you know, if you see us at any of those events, if you're coming to the, the uh, Senior Law Day event this, this fall, seek us out. We're always happy to, happy to chat. All right. I think that we have, oh, wait. I have a question about the WLS system. Are we only able to access resources from our home? library or can we access other libraries in the WLS cooperative? Excellent question, uh, Elizabeth. So the way that the libraries uh, work, you get your permanent card from your home library and you have to get it from your home library. But once you have that card, you can use materials, um, most materials at any from any library. So when you go into our online catalog or you talk to a librarian, there might be a book uh, that you would like to borrow that you don't have at your local library. Perhaps they have it up in Somers. Will uh, you can place a hold on that book um, either on your own through the WS app or the WS website, or you can do that, um, you know, at the library, and we'll deliver that book to your local library. You'll get notifications to go pick it up. Um, when it comes to the online resources, those are also mostly shared, um, so that anything that is available to the system, you should be able to see when you go into Hoopla and search for an audiobook. Um, you know, you can borrow it. Somebody from uh, another community can borrow it. And I encourage people to try the different e-resources because they are different in in slight ways. Um, so Libby and Hoopla are our main resources for ebooks and audiobooks, but Libby and Hoopla also have different business models. The things that are available on Hoopla are simultaneous lending so that multiple people can borrow them at a time uh, from different libraries, from the same library, it doesn't really matter. Whereas Libby is more of that traditional lending model of someone has it out, you gotta wait until they return it and then you're next in line. Um, Are we gonna get copies of the slides? Yes. And my, uh, I, my last- I, I do, I just, I have to go back and finish that up because there is there is a slight caveat to, to all of that. Um, with your library card, there are certain things that you can borrow from your home library that you necessarily, you can't necessarily get uh, from other libraries. A uh, big thing would be museum passes. Somebody had mentioned that in the word cloud up above as something that the libraries lend um, typically a museum pass is limited just to, uh, the local target population or the, you know, the community surrounding that library. Um, this might be the case for Chromebooks or other kind of device loans and sometimes kits. Uh, so libraries will, you know, set up summer kits for birding or, you know, outdoor kits. Really it's, it's a wide range of things. And sometimes those things will be limited. Um, and also a library may purchase specific online uh, like books or audiobooks for their local population um, if they need to kind of like, you know, bump up the the volume of uh, materials that they have. 
But the library, like New Rochelle is very good about sending a pass to your phone. If sending you a, a if you want a museum pass, they will email it to you. So you don't have to go to the library to get it. That is really nice. I mean, I don't know if that that, you know. And my last question, is there any way to get access to newspapers and magazines? Uh, so aside from the in-person access to newspapers and mag magazines, we do have a few uh, databases on the Westchester Library's website um, for accessing like newspaper archives. Uh, magazines are available in OverDrive and I believe Hoopla has uh, some select magazines as well if you're looking for digital digital copies. And, and, I have another question. Um, who would I speak to to offer Hudson River photography programs concerning photo technique, ge photo technique geography, and history on the river? Should that be you? I yeah, was just so programs. To that, yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks, Linda. Um, programs in general are one of those things that's handled on site for each library. So, uh, in terms of providing a program or a presentation on any of those topics, I would encourage you to reach out to the libraries uh, that you're interested in visiting, whether that's just the ones near you or you know the city libraries. However, you want to want to um, kind of prioritize it. Uh, if you need help finding contact information for the libraries, you can find that stuff on the Westchester Libraries website. Uh, and you know what? I might as well show that while we have everybody here. Um, you can go to westchesterlibraries.org. And along the top here, there's, uh, you know, this is how you access information about your, uh, your library account and the catalog. Um, these listen, read, watch research and learn tabs are a lot of our online resources and databases, kind of more so catered to entertainment, towards research, and then towards learning. Uh, and then we also have information about our services and programs, jobs and careers, and then member libraries. This is the tab where you can find your local library either through this mapping tool, um, if it loads. Uh, you can find libraries and their contact info information in here, or you can go straight to the list of libraries and find contact information that way. So in terms of providing presentations or programs, I encourage you to reach out to the libraries. If you want to do something that's a larger kind of series or cross library thing, um, you can reach out to us and we can either help you get in touch with kind of like the libraries that you're, you're looking at, uh, or we can help you coordinate. So it really depends on scale. But I best first spot is reaching out to those particular libraries. Um, and then I saw Pat, uh, who is our uh, CFO, or sorry, our, our, our chief development officer at WLS, sorry. Uh, she put in a, a wonderful stat there, 1.5 million items moved by WLS delivery services in 2023. Uh, so we are moving a lot of material and we love to see it. People, people are not slowing down on their print media consumption by any means. Um, and then there's a note about the museum passes again. It's a discretion of the museum of how things are handled. Yep. Uh, and that might change depending on which library you go to. I'm going to call this a wrap. Um, really, there's just so much that you offer and we're so grateful to you and all your colleagues. Um, thank you, Krishna and Linda for this. This was great. And thank you to all our friends and colleagues at the Westchester Library System and the Westchester Libraries in general for all you do for our community. We appreciate it. And thank you all for attending. We're going to skip a bunch of Jan. It was terrific. Thank we're, you. We're, thank you. We're going to skip a month in June and come back in July. Uh, we're going to be talking about child care, services for seniors, and other important things uh, in the community. Thank for you. All, for all businesses and nonprofits and government agencies. So thank really you. Really good. Really thank good. you all so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you guys. Thank you thank very you. much. Don't be a stranger. Reach out if you if you have questions or I ideas. Dan, can you stay on? <laughs>